Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad you've all been able to join us. This is our first Big Talk live and online. Welcome to the ISBM members meeting. The Thriving Marketer is our topic today. And again, I'm so glad you've all joined us. That is myself. My name is Lynn Yanyo, and I'm the Executive Director of ISBM and uh, responsible in part for putting us in this situation of trying out some new technology. I hope you'll all enjoy this and get a lot out of it. I'm very excited to have you all with, it, with us today. And again, we're looking forward to your feedback as we run this great experiment. Let, re let me remind you of who we are. Uh, we are the Institute for the Study of Business Markets, and we're based out of Penn State. So where this meeting might have been held at Penn State, this is our one image to remind you where we might have been, but now you're all comfortable hopefully wherever you are and able to hear us for the next two days. This is our first live online meeting, as I mentioned. We have over 200 attendees on this meeting, and we have several companies that have chosen to host it in their own conference rooms, and I'm very excited for them to be able to have some dialogue around each of these presentations within their large group. I do encourage you that if you're in a conference room, um, we might have some polls or some questions to ask you as the audience. And so if you'd like to individually uh, answer those polls, um, please open up your laptop or another uh, device and be able to answer for us while you're watching it together. We also have a selection of MBA students from around um, the country as part of our groups of people that are doing research and our research faculty, so I welcome them. And I welcome our new prospective new members. I hope that you'll find this um, educational and useful to you, and I look forward to hearing back from you as well. So let me tell you just a little bit more in that light. Let me tell you just a little bit more in that light about uh, what we do. So we are the world's largest B2B think tank. We are the folks that eat, sleep, and drink the challenges of B2B marketing. We have over 200 academics and educators that are doing research that we've asked them to do for us, and we have world-class companies that are our membership base that help drive the questions and implement the knowledge that we generate. This is just a selection of the academics that we have. Um, I invite you to learn more by visiting our website. In these two days, we will have the distinct pleasure of inducting two more researchers into our fellows program, and I'll tell you a little bit about those um, as they come up. We've got one today, and we've got one tomorrow. We also have over 40 companies as members, and this is, again, just a sampling of the logos that you will recognize. Um, again, this is our first live online meeting. We've always held two member meetings in person, and I want you all to know that we intend to continue having member meetings where we can network with each other. So I know that we're, we heard from a few of you that we're disappointed that you weren't going to be able to get together with each other, but again, um, for this particular experience, we're hoping that it's valuable because you can have more people attend with you during this presentation. Let me tell you just a little bit about what um, ISBM membership offers. And so many of you um, as members have been members for a long time, but I'll just reiterate a few things that we want you to think about so you can get the most value for your membership. We offer professional education and courses. Um, we have coaching and um, marketing lifelines that if you need some help, give us a call. We offer these networking and educational events. We have B2B marketing resources, talent programs, and we do research for you. Um, we have the largest B2B curriculum, as you can see here. And if you're interested in any of these topics, please let myself know or um, uh, just give us an email through um, isbm.org, and we'll be happy to help you. We have a lot of events that we have held and we have planned going forward. And I invite you to, to get these on your calendar. There will be a question that you'll ask later and I'll answer, which is, yes, you'll get a copy of all these slides. I'll also remind you of this throughout the day. So um, coming up, we have a few more webinars. Over this past year, we've had webinars happening about once a month or so. Um, those are recorded, and they're available to you as members through B2B Pulse, which I'll talk about in a minute. And we have an upcoming new event, so I hope you'll hold the date for our next uh, jam session.
We also host an MBA in practice program, and the companies that have been taking advantage of this have found this very useful. If you have a project that uh, an MBA student could help you with, like researching a market, a competitive analysis, looking at trends, or digging up data, um, we have students that are eager to learn by practice and help you as well in your business. And if you're interested in that, just please reach out to us, and we'll be happy to connect you. And as I mentioned earlier, we have something called B2B Pulse. For those of you that are new to um, ISBM and haven't registered, um, again, if you go to b2bpulse at ISBM.org, you can register, and there you will find all of the recordings and all of the information I've been presenting to you. Um, you can also reach out to us, and we'll help you out with anything that you need regarding B2B marketing. So here's those questions that we anticipate you'll have. And after I tell you about these, it will also tell you how you can ask me more questions that I might not have anticipated. So first, let me encourage you highly to ask your questions. And you'll do that through the Q&A window that's on your console. So at the bottom, there are widgets that say Q&A. And you can click on that unless your Q&A window is already open. Where it is open, then you can type in your question and I'll be able to see that in real time. And I'll either prompt the speaker to answer it during the talk, or if it's more appropriate, to wait to the end. But know that your question will be answered if you'll send it to us that way. There are polls that may be offered. And again, you'll respond using your computer screen, your computer keyboard and your screen. And um, if you then can do that, you'll be help it would be helpful to us to get that feedback during the talk. If you're watching as a group and you don't want to answer or ask questions as a group, having a single person offer this, the scribing ability, then please just bring another laptop or two register and join in as an individual. We're going to be looking forward to your feedback after this event as this is our first trial at this method of, and format. So a survey is going to appear at the inclusion of each webcast. If you'd please provide feedback for that particular section, that would be very, very helpful to us. And then there will be an overall request for feedback at the end. Real-time help. So we anticipate that something might happen. There's a help widget um, below the, on the bottom line that you can click on that you can ask questions in that widget. Or we have someone on staff at ISBM that will answer the phone at 814-863-2782 and talk you through any challenges that you have. Please don't hesitate to call. So yes, we will provide access to the materials and the recorded presentations to all of our members via B2B Pulse after the two days of the meeting. And yes, we will provide a list of all attendees to all of our members through B2B Pulse. So if I didn't anticipate any of your questions, please feel free to type them to me now, and then I'll be responding to them at the end of this first presentation. <laughs> So let's look at the agenda for today. Uh, for today, we have four presentations. We'll be starting our first presentation shortly, um, and I'll introduce them in a minute. Each of these presentations is approximately one hour long. It's between 30 to 40 minutes of presentation time and 20 minutes of interaction questions, questions that come from you, the audience, and then are answered live by our presenter. We're suggesting we have about 15 minutes of break between each presentation. Questions might run long, but I'm going to try to hold us to some amount of time between each of those so that those of you that are working together in a conference room space have your own time to discuss this presentation before we move on to the next one. We've scheduled a lunch break at 11.30, uh, returning back at 12.45. That's about 15 minutes before the 1 o'clock presentation because we have a presentation of our newest fellow happening at 12.45. And Gary Lillian will be doing that presentation before we go into Eric's presentation. I hope you'll join us for that, uh, that, that extra 15 minutes. At the close, at the end of our last presentation by Amy Haney, um, I'll do a one-day close, just a summary of that, and provide any other inputs that we need before day two, and then uh, hopefully see you again for day two. So that's the agenda. And again, I'll remind you that if you have questions at any time, please type them in. We'll be monitoring them. Let's turn to our first speaker. 
Our first speaker is Jeff Schmitz. Jeff is the Chief Marketing Officer of Zebra. And he became the, the Marketing Officer in February of 2016. Prior to that, he was the Executive Vice President for multiple business units and for sales at Spirit Communications, where he was also a senior uh, in several senior leadership roles, including their Chief Marketing Officer and the Vice President of Networks and Applications. Prior to Spirit, Jeff was a senior marketing position at Rivulet Communication, Visual Networks, and Telabs. Jeff holds a BS degree in electrical engineering from Marquette and a master of science degree from the Illinois Institute of Technology. And so he fits well with all of us that have these technical educations and are serving in the marketing role. I think you'll find Jeff's presentation very interesting and probably recognize much of the challenges um, that Zebra has been going through and that Jeff is taking them through. So let me turn it over to Jeff. Good morning and thank you, Lynn. My name is Jeff Schmitz. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Zebra Technologies. And maybe as a starting point, I'll give you a little background of Zebra and who we are before we get into this presentation. So Zebra is a company headquartered in the Chicago, Illinois area. And we're a company that, that started as a printer company and turned uh, barcode printing into a $1 billion business. And that barcode printing is used today to bring the physical world into the digital world. So you think about putting a barcode uh, on, a, on, a, uh, on a can in a store or on a package in a warehouse or in a package going to your home, that's bringing that into the digital world. And the company grew up as a, as a barcode specialty printing company. And in 2014, we bought a portion of Motorola. And that portion of Mo Motorola had scanners, scanners like you might see in a grocery store doing inventory or a checkout, as well as mobile computers. And you may see those mobile computers again in, in an airport checking your, checking your baggage or used in, in inventory again in a grocery store. And you may see them if you get in the back in the warehouse, you'll see a number of those as well. And that perspective brings us really into the heart of the Internet of Things, which we'll talk about in a, in a bit. But it also creates some interesting marketing challenges along the way as a company that was known as a printer company and how we're going to evolve that image of the company. And I thought it, it's a good background to understand the origins of the company as we go through our journey in marketing. And so thanks for the opportunity to talk. So I'm going to talk about key things. One is how technology is, is, is impacting our business, and I think everyone's business, and changing the landscape of the key verticals that we operate in, uh, which are ones you'd be certainly familiar with. Uh, the impact of corporate branding, particularly in our case, when you think about a company that, that was in one space and we added a whole other portfolio, and we're taking that, that entire footprint onto a higher level, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, we'll also talk about marketing strategic role and how to stretch marketing from its traditional bounds into some maybe more non-traditional bounds and some things that we're doing here at Zebra that I think you might find interesting. And lastly, in practical ways, marketing can then facilitate innovation. We're certainly coming faster uh, today, and there's three things. And the first is the Internet of Things, and I'm sure you've, you've heard about the Internet of Things. But when I think about the Internet of Things, I'm thinking about the edge of the network. And at the edge of the network, where, again, the first part of the Internet of Things is how do I sense what's happening at the edge of the network? How do I bring data and information in? How do I take the physical world and bring it in the, into the digital world? And that's where the Internet of Things begins at the edge. By the way, that's where Zebra lives and breathes, right? When you're either you're putting an RFID or a, la a label on a, a package or you're tracking a player in the NFL or you're tracking a nurse in a hospital environment, collecting all that data is the beginnings of the Internet of Things. The second technology that's really driving our business is cloud technology. Once I have all that data from the edge of the network, I want to bring it back into central location. And from that central location, now I can start providing analytics on it. I can look at trends. I can look at information and data that, that tells me maybe what my next best move is. Most of the business we operate in, let me give an example, transportation logistics, a driver runs out with a, a set of packages and they have a predetermined route that they're going on. <clears throat> what our technology is, is there to do is, if I have information about where that truck is going and perhaps somebody wants to redirect the package, how do I give them the next best route or reroute that truck so it can be more efficient rather than having a preordained 
set of places I'm stopping, why not be able to reroute? And once I can get that data from the edge and I can find information that says maybe there's a good reason for reroute in the cloud, then I can redirect that person. And that leads to the third component, and that's uh, enterprise-grade mobile devices. So once I have mobile devices in the hands of all my employees, then I can redirect that workforce at a moment's notice. So again, putting them all together, if I have information from the edge, this can help me make better decisions. If I pull that into the cloud, and then I can redirect my workforce with a uh, mobile device, I've really put all those pieces together. And as we think about at least the Zebra journey for us, as we started kind of in the Internet of Things as, a, as something we've been doing now for, you know, 20-plus years, now we've added on to that capability the ability to then scan those packages, those, uh, those uh, assets along the way, and um, bring them into the cloud, and then ultimately redirect the workforce with the mobile devices which we added. So th these three trends, which you see in many verticals, are critical for us to get an idea of how quickly things are changing, let's look at all three of those different technologies and, and some predictions about where they'll be uh, in just the next few years. So if we start at the edge of the network and those, uh, uh, connected, um, uh, those connected devices, you can see that we're going to go from 8.4 uh, billion connected devices to t over 20 billion by 2020. That's incredible growth. Um, secondly, when we look at the cloud technology, now you're looking at the amount of data that you're storing. So 4.4 uh, data bytes of data, and that's a huge amount of data, is going to grow by an order of magnitude over just the next few years. And lastly, we're seeing this in many of our verticals. More and more people are, are providing mobile devices for their workforce to make them more productive. And so you see that growing uh, at, at a significant number. And all that's really driving the enterprises to help them lower their cost, improve their workflows, increase productivity, and expand into new markets. So these trends are very dynamic and moving very quickly. Now, this slide's interesting because what it also shows is while this technology is changing quickly, so is our ability to digest and absorb this. So while it took radio 38 years to become mainstream, and by the way, I'm I'm defining mainstream here as 50 million users. That shrunk to 13 years for t television, uh, four years for the Internet, three and a half years for Twitter. And if you bring that all the way up to something more recent here in the last year or so, if you look at Pokemon Go, they reached 50 million users in a mere 35 days. Now, this presents all kinds of challenges, not just business challenges, but also marketing challenges, because as companies – move very swiftly in that, and that uh, technology is digested into the mainstream, it's important that the marketing message change and you're reaching those new customers, you're changing your brand, uh, and you're driving more and more business. So thinking about how do you apply all this technology into a few of our key verticals, and here's not every vertical we plan, but here's a few of the larger ones. So retail is one. So once I have all these dynamics and you look at change, probably the industry we'd start looking at saying, wow, this one's changed, is retail, right? And today, by the way, every, almost every day I can read in the paper or online the demise of the, of the store. There's never going to be another bricks-and-mortar store. But if you step back and look at retail, retail's changing for sure. Uh, I'm not sure all those uh, predictions of the demise of, of shopping are true. Today, e-commerce – Companies like Amazon and others represents right around 10% of the total um, retail business. So there's still 90% out there that's brick and mortar. And clearly e-commerce is going to grow. It's expected to grow uh, and double in the next you know, few years. So next five, five to ten years, that should more than double. But it won't go to 100%. Um, and by the way, for e-commerce, that's a, that's a wonderful thing for Zebra because we're certainly involved in barcoding and moving all that, uh, all those goods into and out of the warehouse and eventually shipping them uh, to customers. So e-commerce is good business for us. But in terms of how technology is changing retail, the other thing that, that we know is that we've done our own uh, shopper study and retail studies, and we know that people love to shop, right? Most people like to go to the store and like to have a good experience in the store. 
Um, and as a result, we don't think that stores are going to go away. In fact, um, we suspect that we're going to see more of a hybrid kind of environment. And you see this already developing today where maybe I can go to your site, uh, your e-commerce site, and buy uh, online and maybe pick it up in store. Or I can buy it online, ship it to my home, and then uh, return it in store. And this is changing the dynamics for the retail store because while the retail store was worried about inventory and inventory was important, we know from our own studies that retail inventory accuracy is roughly 60%. Now, 60% might be okay if you're just running a bricks and mortar store. However, if you want to do buy online, pick up in store, you need to know what your inventory is uh, 100% or darn close to it because nobody wants the experience of ordering online, showing up at the store and saying, oops, we just don't have anything in stock. So the technology needed to understand and get retail inventory up, you know, north of 90% is required, and it exists today. And again, it starts with edge sensing and bringing that data back into the cloud and ultimately being able to redirect uh, the workforce so they know where those uh, products are in the store. We have launched a product uh, uh, early this uh, year called SmartLens that does this very thing. But what we're seeing is this move to the middle where – not everything's going to be online. Not everything's going to be in the store. It's going to be a combination. Sometimes it's called uh, omni-channel. And there's no better sign of that that Amazon, if they took any business out from a brick-and-mortar perspective, it would be bookstores. Yet by the end of the year, Amazon will have about a dozen bookstores. They're actually building bookstores because they see that. Probably the bigger piece of evidence of how retail is changing is Amazon bought Whole Foods, and that's going to give them 400 brick-and-mortar stores to, uh, one, learn about the grocery business, but secondly, uh, provide them an outlet for people who, again, like shopping and grocery shopping is going to continue and probably outlets where they can uh, drive uh, groceries to your home. So we see retail changing dramatically. I don't think it's going to go all to e-commerce, um, but we see it as an environment where technology is critical both in the store and uh, in the e-commerce and bringing those worlds together. And that's probably a great example of how things are changing and how rapidly they're changing. We also see this in healthcare. Interestingly enough, 30% of nurses' time is spent wasted doing, uh, you know, paperwork and, and double checking things. And healthcare also benefits from some of these same attributes, right? So today, when you check into a hospital, oftentimes you'll get a, a wristband with a barcode on it. Your medication will have a barcode on it. We can do things called positive patient ID, so so a nurse can carry around a mobile device, scan your wristband, scan your medication keep track of all the documentation of what medicine that you've gotten and ensure that you get the right person gets the right medicine at the right time. Um, we also track uh, pathology samples through the hospital as another way of digitizing the hospital and bringing that information to life. We also track equipment and even nurses and enable collaboration, whether that's by voice or secure text, in a hospital environment. So you can see people are adopting this technology. It's critical to have that information from the edge and make better decisions along the way through the workflow. Now, another vertical that we, we play in that is also changing and maybe you, you wouldn't think of traditionally is, is in the area of sports. So in the area of sports, uh, I think uh, we'll talk about American football here specifically, and I guess at Penn State there's no uh, greater sport to talk about than football, and in, I'm proud to say my son is a junior in computer engineering at Penn State, and I was able to come see the, uh, the game this past weekend, and... Uh, it's good fun, but sports is changing. It's becoming very analytical. You hear about coaches becoming uh, just absolutely uh, obsessed with data and information. And sports is, sports is becoming much more of a science than an art, and data is critical. And Zebra is helping change sports as well by providing more of that edge data and analytics to augment the broadcast and to augment the coach's ability to understand what's happening on the field and how to improve. Following a competition among top global technology vendors in 2014, the NFL selected Zebra as its official on-field player tracking provider, introducing its revolutionary next-generation player tracking system, disrupting the status quo in sports data tracking, previously limited to one-dimensional GPS-based monitoring devices and optical tracking systems. With the 2014 launch, Zebra Sports earned the 2015 Sports Business Awards Best in Sports Technology. 
not one to rest on its laurels, Zebra Sports continued to push for firsts in 2015 with another truly breakthrough year. Leading the charge in continuing to revolutionize tracking technology and next generation statistics in sports. This past year, Zebra and Wilson successfully led the deployment of the next level of tracking technology, sport tracking, with its introduction of the first ever RFID instrumented trackable football, which created a tough engineering challenge to embed an active RFID tag inside the ball without affecting its physical integrity. Zebra also reduced the size of its patented RFID tag by more than 50%. Through its partnership with Zebra, the NFL widened the gap between old school data tracking and Zebra's state-of-the-art sport tracking technology. Zebra Sports achieved another first in 2015 by broadening its product functionality. Because Zebra's system is a true tracking system, providing data in real time with an accuracy of inches, new applications were created for both fans and team operations personnel. In 2015, next-gen stats came to life, driving fan engagement across multiple media platforms, including NFL.com, NFL Social Media, Microsoft Xbox, CBS and NBC NFL game broadcasts. Zebra also introduced three new data tracking modules, schematic for coaches, tactics for scouting, and performance for trainers, will provide new insights into game planning, drastically decrease the operational load of coaches and scouting staff, and assist trainers in helping players reach peak performance. Another milestone achievement in 2015 was Zebra Sports' successful completion of the largest global deployment of any real-time sport tracking system in the world, fitting all 31 NFL stadium venues in the United States, Wembley Stadium in London, and Aloha Stadium in Hawaii. Zebra tagged and tracked 2,500 plus different NFL players and collecting more than 180 billion bytes of position data. Zebra also strategically expanded into college football through partnerships with the University of Tennessee, the University of Washington, and Ohio State University, providing the same game day solution it provides the NFL and setting the foundation for improved operations and enhanced fan consumer experiences. Zebra Sports Solution was selected by the NCAA for deployment during the Fiesta Bowl, the 2015 college football playoffs, and national championship game. By any measure, 2015 was another year of extraordinary firsts for Zebra Sports, forging new ways to engage fans while assisting leagues, teams, and personnel with insightful new data through innovative technology, continuing its mission as the driving force in sports technology. So hopefully you see how uh, technology is moving swiftly, and, it, and it's, it's changing not just from a technology perspective, but it's changing the way businesses are operating. And again, we showed you a few examples there. I think the NFL is a great example of how things are changing so you know, dramatically. The second thing I want to talk about here is, is brand. And when we think about uh, the impact of a corporate brand, it's becoming increasingly important because things are changing so quickly, oftentimes the value of the brand and the understanding of the brand and the essence of the brand may be changing. That's particularly true at, at Zebra. As I told you before, we started out as a printing company, and we've done brand equity studies. We know people when we say, who's Zebra Technologies? If you know who we are, you'd say, you guys are the barcode printing guys. I know that if I get a package home and has a barcode on it, it likely came from you or the shelves on the store in, my, in the grocery store, the retail store. Uh, people understand that. What they don't understand is we bought this component from Motorola, and what they don't understand is now that we have this complete portfolio, you know, we can go to market by really fundamentally changing people's workflows. So a significant amount of brand work needs to happen. Even if you don't have a dramatic event like Zebra had, changing the brand uh, is going to be critical because things are changing so rapidly. So here's a classic graph that shows, uh, and this was done by McKenzie and Interbrand, and it shows if you look at uh, the top 40 brands, that they're able to drive a total shareholder return that's 70% greater uh, than the, than, uh, the aggregate uh, brand. So you can see that there's a financial gain to having a strong brand. Um, but the real question is, how do, I, how do I change that brand? Yes, I want to increase awareness and I want to uh, create more trust and uh, make sure that people understand my differentiation and, and, and add value. And that's certainly very important. But the real question is, how can, I, how can I change that brand 
quickly, as quick as the technology and the applications are, are changing, and then how do I create that branch starting from the inside out? So we're going to show you a video here that shows how the new combination of Zebra technology has come together to move us forward into what we call you know, visibility that's visionary. How do we take the technology we have to really change those workflows in the environments that we work in? So uh, here's the video. Systems to software, people to products, data to devices. In today's world, everything is becoming more and more connected and it's happening at a dizzying exponential rate. Staying ahead of your competition means staying ahead of the curve, using technology to transcend and having the ability to see into every corner of your operation from a vantage point which delivers a decided advantage. That kind of visibility is truly visionary and Zebra is making it happen. Only Zebra's intelligent solutions bolster your business with unprecedented connectivity, mobility, productivity, and visibility. By seamlessly connecting every element, you get access to real-time data and intelligence and make smarter, more informed decisions. It's transforming the very way industries and enterprises operate. Like transportation and logistics, where visibility into truck capacity and delivery optimization translates into huge savings on fuel. Healthcare, where positive patient identification connects the right patient to the right care at the right time, every time. Manufacturing, where seeing the big picture means anticipating customer orders, the right inventory, reduced pick times, and flawless fulfillment. And retail, where having the right product in the right place increases sales, and faster checkout times boost customer satisfaction. Only Zebra's visibility solutions maximize your company's potential by presenting you with every facet, every fact, every favorable opportunity. See your enterprise in its entirety. View things from every aspect and angle. Shed light on insights in an instant. See what can happen when you can see it all. Zebra. Visibility. That's visionary. Okay. Now I want to talk about how marketing's role has changed. And I'm sure many of you see, have, have looked at customer journey maps. And the role of marketing is fundamentally changing. And in the past, I think we, we often thought about marketing as well. You know, we're creating the the brand essentials, and we are getting out some awareness, and we're trying to generate interest, and that was the customer journey mapping that we looked at for marketing. And then quickly, we'd hand that over to a salesperson. Um, and I, I'll give you an example that I think everyone can resonate with if you bought a car in the last 10 years. Uh, at least for me, when I bought my first car, I didn't know anything, and I went into the store, and I said, I, I think I kind of want this brand of car, and I went and talked to the salesman, and they gave me all the specifics and helped me sort through what my budget was and what cars were interesting. Well, no one would buy a car like that today, right? The, the customer journey is, is much more on your own. It's much more self-service. I'm going to go to your website. I'm going to get your digital experience. I'm going to build the car I want. And by the time I come in, I know the invoice. I know the price I want to pay. I know the color I want. I know the options I want. And that's happening even in the B2B world. So as we look at how the customer journey looks now, marketing is having a much bigger influence, not just on the awareness and the interest, but really driving the consideration, the intent, the evaluation. And we can see statistics uh, over and over again where 80% of business-to-business -business, um, business -business transactions start with a, a search, right? So that's where they're starting, and, and a lot of the investigation happens online. People are looking for reviews of your product, even in a B2B. They're looking for other people's opinion of your product online. So the digital experience is absolutely critical, and 67% of the customer journey is happening even in B2B before sales gets involved. So this is a fundamental change into, into the, the way that marketing has to operate, uh, and, and that changes the way we have to look at the things that we do. Now, 
Here, here at Zebra, I think like most marketing organizations, we do all the basics, right? So we certainly concentrate on awareness. We make sure the tools are out there for sales enablement, so they know how to sell the products. They know the differentiation of the products and services and solutions. We're helping generate demand, and we're bu- building up leads, and we're passing those on to our sales and partners. And we certainly know how to, to launch products, and that's quite traditional, and we've certainly done that. And we'll talk in a bit about some of our digital marketing experiences and, and new things we're doing, but we do all that traditional stuff. Some of the things that we're doing that kind of stretch the bounds of marketing that I think are interesting to think about uh, are, are, first of all, uh, digital, right? If 80% of B2B transactions start with a search, well, my search engine optimization better be pretty good. If people are looking for a barcode printer or a scanner or a flatbed scanner like in a grocery or a mobile computer, they better find my products first in that list. And they better be on page one or one of the top three items. Nobody looks at page two. I don't remember the last time I got to a page two search. Um, It's got to be there. So your digital marketing has to be very strong. And some of that starts with um, search engine optimization. And then, of course, there's um, uh, paid uh, and earned digital media as well. But the digital strategy is absolutely critical. And I'm sure everyone's on that journey already. Where we're starting to see expansions here of marketing is we're now – pushed into not just the marketing component, but also some of the business components. And there's three here at Zebra that we've expanded to to bring into marketing. One is business market intelligence. So as we get more data about our customers and our market share and our growth rates and how our customers are using our product, we've brought that capability, and I kind of view this as an analyst firm inside the company. Right, so kind of like a gardener inside the company. They're, they're both tracking our market share in the past and looking forward and predicting uh, what, where our markets are going in the future, what's growing, what's shrinking, and helps us make strategic decisions. The second thing is vertical marketing. So I've kind of described to you what I would call a basic product company. Right. So we've talked about the three key products that we have here at Zebra. However, we really go to market in a vertical way. We don't, you know, we don't just say, buy my barcode scanner. When we go to market, we're really focusing on a vertical perspective. So, for example, in healthcare, you know, we have specialized products for healthcare, but we go to healthcare and we say, how do we improve your, you know, your patient, positive patient ID? How do we improve your, your specimen tracking? How do we improve your collaboration with your healthcare professionals? That's how we go to market. We don't just concentrate on the product. And by having a vertical marketing team, ones we concentrate on going to market through verticals so we can have a specific message to those personas that are making decisions in those verticals as opposed to just speeds and feeds on a product. And secondly, what we've also done is we've inside marketing, we've become kind of the product manager for these verticals, meaning if we can see a new solution that we can bring together with our products and services, we are actually championing those as if we're product managers building a business case saying, let's go build this solution around, you know, pathology or asset tracking in a hospital, and we're championing those and building those business cases in vertical marketing. So we're pushing the limits of marketing, and I think it's very healthy for a marketing organization to have some grounding in the business, and this really helps us do that. And lastly, uh, at least for us, we're very much a channel-centric organization. 80-plus percent of our business goes through a channel, so we're not selling it directly. And as a result, it's important that we understand the health of that of that channel. And we in marketing actually own the channel program. And this is important because when we think about marketing, yes, we're marketing to the end user and trying to create demand and awareness out of the end user, but we're also marketing to and through our channel because the channel also is critical to promoting our products to the end users since most of our product flows through that channel. So here's at least four ways where we are pushing the envelope of where marketing is going, making sure we have a solid grounding in the business. Brand ambassadorship. Again, when we think about brand, and we've spent a lot of work since the acquisition in late 2014 on rebuilding our brand essence around visibility that's visionary, the video you saw earlier. And it's important that this starts from the inside out. Most companies and B2B companies are not going to have a gigantic advertising budget to drive a, drive a paid strategy to drive enough awareness uh, in, their, in their business. So it starts with 
you know, the brand ambassadors inside your company. How do you enable your employees to really be able to, look, what I like to say is give an elevator pitch or a cocktail party story where they can explain what the business is and where it's going. And it starts with brand ambassadorship. It starts with, you know, using our six, you know, over 6,500 employees, being able to tell that story to their friends, to their families, to their colleagues, and driving that message out is critically important. An aspect of that is once you get your brand ambassadors where they can tell that story, how do you get more and more of them talking on social media? So this is becoming a critical factor for us is how do we use social media? Because it's one thing to talk to people. It's another thing to have that presence on social media. And again, we know that over 60% of people in the B2B environment will consult and look at social media and what people are saying about you as well as what you're saying about yourself on social media. So you've got to find ways to get those brand ambassadors and key thought leaders to be active in social media. And it's easier said than done, but it's critical that, that you get a focus on this. And an area that we've been particularly focused on, and we've driven our social media engagements up dramatically over the last two years, but it's important to get that message out there. And as I always like to say, you know, you know, hundreds of small voices can be more important than one big loudspeaker. And this is a way to do that through brand ambassadorship and using social media as a way to, to boost your awareness, boost your SEO, boost the uh, footprint that you're, you're having in the market. That's not just a paid environment. Okay. Next is thought leadership. So there's a few things that, that we do here that directly relate to thought leadership, and it's important, particularly when you're trying to blaze a new trail, like we are in terms of optimizing workflows and, and um, creating a, a different environment for the, the verticals that we serve, it's important to be viewed as a thought leader. And, and we do a number of things to do that. One is vision studies. So we do surveys consistently in our verticals, manufacturing uh, surveys, retail surveys, warehouse surveys of, of how those environments are changing and how they're using technology at a more rapid clip to improve their operations, lower their costs, improve their efficiency. And uh, we use those a lot and we get a lot of coverage. So uh, recently, uh, last year we had a warehouse study that got picked up by the Wall Street Journal. Um, we've uh, got coverage from recently from the New York Times on what we're doing with the NFL. So when you can create these vision studies where you're polling your customers, you're creating insights into these verticals, it's, it's really, it really can help raise the awareness to uh, earn media. <coughs> um, secondly, there's no better advocate for you than your customers, and it's always difficult. Customers oftentimes, <coughs> excuse me, don't want to go public that they've purchased or are using your equipment, but when you can make that happen, it's very important. We have over 100 case studies, and these become very important if I can push them externally, but equally they're great sales enablement, even though I can't use them externally. If you're in retail and I can show you how other retail customers are optimizing their networks using our technology, it's very powerful getting them to see, hey, if other people are doing it, then I need to do it. Uh, we certainly use speaking engagements, and we drive a fair bit of earned media, as I said before, through our vision studies and where we can our case studies. So um, one other note about thought leadership as we move into this, we, we recently uh, did a symposium at Harvard. We brought together 50 leaders, and this is a very inventive way to, to drive some thought leadership, and the first time we've done this, brought together 50 leaders from across government, academia, healthcare, manufacturing, transportation, logistics, and retail. And we brought them all together to, to, to walk through, and it was facilitated by Harvard. And you know, what, what is happening in the environment, in, in the, in the uh, intelligent enterprise? How do we capitalize that? And it was a great discussion, by the way. We brought some customers, prospects, other people were there. And it was very interesting. It was the first time we brought multiple uh, people from different verticals together. We saw very interesting interactions. One I thought was particularly interesting um, is that we had a, a researcher from MIT there. And one of the things that they were doing from an IoT perspective is they were actually sampling uh, the sewer in New York City. You may say, boy, that's kind of odd, and, and it is. But from that data, they were able to tell neighbor, neighborhood by neighborhood 
what kind of food people are eating, what kind of medication they're on, and then they can then understand, uh, you know, what kind of uh, issues they, you know, they may be having that are, you know, in a particular area. And it was a very interesting set of data and a little bit shocking, but that's a, we could go on and on about that. But what I found most interesting is in the crowd was um, a, um, a physician from uh, the University of Maryland, and her, she was saying, hey, if I could get access to that data, I could, I could have a better understanding of the patients coming in from a particular area, what kind of issues they may ha- be having, whether it was a catastrophic issue or a, a, or a chronic kind of issue. If I had that data, I could use it. It was very interesting to see when you get people from different verticals together, how some of this data that we're starting to see come together has an influence from one vertical to the next. Oftentimes we think inside a you know healthcare environment, how that might work, or inside a um, government agency, how that might be helpful. But there's really connectivity between them. And it was very interesting to see that in this Harvard Symposium, and we've used this to create white papers, checklists. We've actually advanced uh, numerous uh, wins in our business as a result of this. So I'm going to show you this video, kind of uh, um, what we did at that time, and give you a feel for it. Most forward-leaning customers, those that are leading the industry, that are, you know, making the biggest, boldest moves first, are the ones that are going after targeted use cases, building those out end to end across that stack of Sense Analyze Act, uh, deploying that, getting a return on investment from it, and then kind of bootstrapping that investment back into the next solution that they deploy. So, uh, it's really not so much about infrastructure or capability, IT infrastructure required on premise or in the cloud, for that matter. It's more embracing the notion that workflows can be improved if new data can be discovered, and then you know just jumping with both feet to uh, to go and make that happen on a use case by use case basis. You know, I see more and more of this RFID technology really running a plant, not necessarily moving it, but moving the data. You make decisions on data now. You don't make decisions on data that happened yesterday. What I see is IoT and uh, IoT powered machine learning actually making our jobs that much less stressful so that the data we have actually matches our expectations and reality, or in the cases when our expectations don't match reality, we have the information that can allow us to understand how to bridge the gap. Data is an important characteristic, but there's a layer above that, which is knowledge. Right? So it's not enough to become data-driven. We need to become knowledge-driven or science-driven, uh, whatever euphemism you want to use. And so I think that um, these new technologies or approaches or methodologies, they are allowing us to get deeper into the problems than we had been able to do just a few years ago. The technology's been out there for years, but getting the people to adapt you know, to use the technology is the struggle. But once we show it, and have the proof concept, the proof that it works, it's more quickly accepted and more people want to learn more about it. So often I think in academia, and rightfully so, we're, we're very much focused on our problem and the technology and less so concerned about the actual applications or you know the value of this in a real world context. And I think our lab, at least, Sensible City Lab, we are very applied in what we do, but we're still within that academic framework. And so it was really nice to be able to talk to people from industry who, I mean, just in a two-minute conversation, just had a completely different vision for what Underworlds could be. And that was, I think, for me, really valuable insight to have. Amazon or Fed, uh, FedEx uh, is another classic example of putting information in the hands of users. Where is this package? Um, and uh, turning an openness and exposure uh, not into a liability, but turning out that being open and transparent generates a lot of trust and an increase in business. So relative to just 12 months ago, you know, we see an incredible pull. And uh, I've been saying this for a while, just over the last 12 to 18 months, this has become much less of a push message around intelligent enterprise and enterprise asset intelligence, and much more of customers saying, I need to run my operations in real time. I need continuous flow of data. I need to understand what's happening at the edge of my operations. 
and I need, I need to be able to use that information in an insightful way to provide better experiences. The area that's really hit me is the human element. And whenever we look at these Internet of Things uh, kind of systems, the human element's key. And one thing that came out, probably the starting point is, you know, where's the vision for this technology? Could you get overwhelmed with the data and the sensors and the hardware and the software? But what are we really trying to accomplish? What's the vision? What's really disruptive and changing uh, in, the, in the industries where we can apply this technology? Our message, our thinking, and our call to action with our customers and here at the Innovation Symposium is to embrace that. Think first about how you need to change your workflows in order to benefit from all the data that the intelligent enterprise is going to, uh, is going to provide to you. Okay, so in closing, I guess I want to hit on the four key things. One is the pace of change is happening rapidly, both in technology and the absorption by end users of that technology. And the result is marketing needs to move just as quickly as these technologies are moving. We need to change the brand. We need to think differently about you know, how we go to market. Secondly, uh, brand is important, and brand, your brand is going to change as these changes in technology and in these verticals happen. And in order to, to, to jumpstart that, you need to make sure that you're on top of that and you're, used, you're starting from the inside out. Use your brand ambassadors. Use social media. It's really important. And to make sure you're aligned with your, your strategic direction of your company. And with that, I'd go to point three, which is when you see opportunities to expand marketing more in the business, so you're not just in the awareness and thought leadership space, um, grab it, seize it. It's important that marketing become a more critical part of the business, and, and we've certainly done that here, and I, I recommend that. And lastly, never forget that in today's environment, a lot of small voices and small speakers can be more important than a big megaphone. And it's important. It's hard to get going with social media. Sometimes it's difficult to curate the content. It's difficult to get the people you want active on social media because maybe they're just that they're not built for that. But there are tools and ways to get out there and do that. And it's critically important because you can build up a lot more noise with a bunch of small speakers than you can with a giant megaphone. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Jeff, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much. It feels like it is exciting times there at Zebra. I'm excited for you. Um, so everyone who has been on the audience today, I just want to remind you that you have a window called Q&A. Please feel free to use that to send us messages or ask questions. And so Jeff, I'm going to queue up uh, a few of the questions that have come in. Again, audience, you're, you're communicating to us with writing. We can't hear you. Um, hopefully you're hearing us, but you can't, we can't hear you. So um, if you would please type your questions to us in the Q&A box. And if you're looking um, at this presentation as a group and you'd like to ask your own questions, feel free to log in separately just to answer the questions. So here's the first question, Jeff. Um, I'm really right. curious about this. So it seems like um, you have a lot of uh, activities going on developing things for customers. Is it marketing that is bringing those requirements back to your organization, or is, does R&D interface with customers directly? Yeah, so at Zebra, the, I would say that the, there's, a, there's a couple interfaces for customers. So we all like to have interfaces with customers, and certainly marketing does. When it comes to product development, though, I think we're pretty traditional in that uh, the development teams usually are, are guided by a product management team. And that product management team has a lot of customer exposure, and they're driving a lot of the um, product changes, new product requests in those business units. Now, I would say that when we start doing things like uh, more complicated solutions, we typically use our CTO office. So that's another area where we can spawn new uh, solutions. And lastly, I talked about vertical marketing. So we so we get away from just building new features, functions, speeds, and feeds on existing products or coming up with new similar products, uh, and we get even away from maybe a, a high-level solution. We do in vertical marketing, which is one of those kind of expansion areas of marketing, we do have vertical experts in, in our primary verticals, and they, can, they work with customers directly, and they're trying to drive um, product development as well. So we have a, a few touch points. Great. 
Okay. okay. Here's another interesting question um, that I think a lot of us struggle with. So you've talked about uh, social media and have made a great um, case for involving the whole company in social media. And in the world of B2B, I think that's still a challenge for many of us. So can you tell us how um, Zebra has been able to help your senior leadership be involved in the social aspects of marketing? Yeah, this is a great, great question, and we've been on kind of a journey here. I think when, when, uh, when I started and I asked a few of the executives about social media, they said, hey, can you get me an account and just, you know, put stuff out there for me? I think that was the initial response. And we're like, well, there, there actually are some issues with that, and think if it's your personal account and things. So what we've done, and I don't want to give a commercial name but we, uh, to any particular tool, but we did find a tool that makes it easy to share. So we've, we've kind of trained people. We started for small. We started with about 10 executives who we thought were open to the idea. We found a tool so that once we curated content, it would be easy for them to share and add their opinions on top of articles, whether they were zebra-generated or they were just areas of interest for those individuals. That was based on a profile. So each of the 10 uh, people we started with, we built a profile, things they might be interested in. Uh, we curated content for them. We put it in the tool so it was easy for them to share and add their thoughts. So we made it as easy as possible for them. And we also tried to make sure we're curating content that's not just Zebra. You don't want – nobody's listening if you just uh, take your own internal stuff and just amplify it through your executives. You have to add a point of view. You have to find – curate content that's not just your own, that's of interest to that persona and to that person, then you have to make it easy for the executives to engage. And we've been pretty pretty lucky. We launched our, uh, our first 10 or so executives in the second quarter. We have over a million um, touch points on social media already, which is a pretty good number because a lot of these folks weren't really active in social media. So uh, that's kind of how we went about it, and it's been so far so good. That, that's great. That, uh, I'm glad to hear it. And I understand you don't want to share the uh, or make a commercial for it, but I'm pretty sure some folks would really love to know what you think of the tool that you've used. So if you okay. want to share it, we'll let you. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're using a tool called Gaggle Amp is the tool. And again, it it's, makes it pretty easy uh, because when, uh, and we have, you know, the marketing people curating content. When they curate content, for me or for the executive, you get a notification, so it's easy. It's not another yet another email. It's just a notification. You go to the app. Uh, hopefully, you read the content. You add some uh, quick uh, point of view, and you can share it. And it also is nice. And most of these tools do this. They also, if you if we've curated two or three articles, or maybe you've let them stack up a little bit, it will also schedule them so you don't have them all coming out in one big burst, and it will allow you to kind of schedule them and push them out over time, even if you don't get to it on a daily basis. So that's the tool we're using. There are other tools as well that are similar. I love it. Gaggle app. I'm putting that on my list. Okay, so we have another question here that I think we often um, think about in the B2B space, too, considering the, the businesses that we run. Have you faced any legal concerns or any barriers in being able to move to cloud-based solutions, either internally or externally with customers? Well, I think whenever you move to cloud, there's two challenges. Um, one is uh, security uh, in general. So, you know, how secure is the data? Uh, a second issue, which is related, is privacy, which is how are you going to share that data? who you're going to share it with intentionally, not unintentionally. So those are a couple areas that always uh, come up when you're dealing with the cloud. We're, we're just launching our cloud platform. We do, have, we do have some services like the Whirlpool example where we're in the cloud. And I think uh, we've been able to address our customers' concerns in those two areas. And you clearly have to get customers through that, right? They have to feel that their information is secure from people you don't want to get access to it and that they understand the privacy rules so that they know uh, that that data will only be shared on, under certain circumstances. So uh, I think that you always have that barrier and have to work through it case by case. Great. Thank you. And then I'll, I'll take this one last one, and I'll uh, mention if you, anyone wants to add an additional question, send it in in the next minute while I ask this last question, which is one that I think we're all thinking, and I wonder if you'll share with us, what do you think marking will look like five years from now? Wow. Okay, that's a great yeah. that's a great question. That's another another whole uh, presentation, I think. But um, 
You know, clearly the the areas where I see uh, marketing becoming more important is really uh, more about the digital experience, right? So much of our biz- our businesses, and this is really true of almost every business, is becoming digital. And the digital experience covers so much of the buyer's journey. I think when I look at marketing, no matter what it is, whether it's awareness or sales enablement, uh, uh, demand generation, or product launch, you know, the importance of being of being digital is going to be the dominant factor. And I think we'll find more and more of our resources and our money going to enhance the digital experience and how people experience the company, the sales process, um, et cetera, will be the focus of, of marketing organizations primarily. And everything we do, I think, will be concentrating there. You, you still see, even in our business, there's still a lot of desire, you know, for people to do cut sheets and data sheets, and there's a certain amount of that that we still have to do. So we're we're doing all the digital stuff, and we're still kind of carrying through some of the artifacts of things that marketing, I think, used to do more traditionally, and I think those will fall to the wayside. I don't think people honestly have the attention span to read a document. You know, I, I, I may have mentioned it earlier. You know, I read an article recently that said 42 percent of college graduates never read another book after they leave university. So people's attention span is getting shorter. They don't want to read at all, and they don't want to uh, read anything that's long, and that's for sure. And uh, people want to get what they, you know, what they need and small snippets when they need it. And that's why I think the digital experience is so important. And some of the traditional kind of written uh, things will go away. Um, so that's kind of how I see it. Great. Um, th- here's another question that came in that I think is really valuable to us as well. So it seems like case studies are really valuable as a resource for your marketing efforts, and I think that's probably true for all of us in the B2B space. But we have a challenge sometimes getting customer testimonials, and you had made a, a statement about what, you know if the customer will let you even use their name. Um, is there a particular format that works for others? Is there a particular way that you get those things to, to be successful to get those testimonials that to be able, able to be used? Well, always easier said than done. I think everyone who's been down this road knows that you know, a lot of customers are reluctant uh, to to say what choices they made for for all kinds of reasons. But we find the uh, and by the way, the, I think where the biggest value is is, is uh, certainly marketing when we can say externally what we've done. But also, it's very important for the sales process. I, if, if sales is out working on an account where we've sold and helped, uh, you know, similar customers and maybe potentially uh, their competitors improve their operations, and we understand how that worked, you know, that's a really important thing. Even if you can't say their name, um, I think it, you know that's one of the benefits of working with a co- you know a company. Um, like ours is, you know, we're working with uh, not just retail store A, we're working with B, C, D, E, and F, I and mean, we service 95% of the Fortune 500. So we have a good view of how people are using this technology. So I would say, first and foremost, I, sales is probably the number one uh, organization that can use these. Now, <clears throat> as it turns out, getting them uh, is difficult. And what we found is the best way is to introduce the concept early in the process. If you if the deal is done and and all the signatures are inked on the contract, it becomes very difficult to introduce the idea at that point of getting it. You know, can you do a case study? Can you particularly do a video case study, which we find the most valuable? And can we share it broadly and you know externally? That's really difficult. But the best way to do that is to introduce that concept early, let them know that that's part of what you're looking for, and you know, usually uh, B2B deals go through some level of negotiation, and when they're, when that negotiation happens, uh, some, as long as your salespeople have that uh, in mind as one of the things you want, sometimes that becomes uh, an, a thing that's easier to get then than it is, again, at the end of the deal. And because, quite honestly, the business owner is going to make the business decision, and if they say, you know, hey, look, we think we're going to cut an aggregately better deal by if we do this uh, press release or video um, case study with this vendor, they have a lot more influence over the marketing team then than they will later. And you know, after the fact, it's much more difficult to get the marketing teams of um, of your customers to comply with doing these kinds of activities. 
I think that's a great piece of advice. I hadn't even thought about the timing, which is if you can start that process as early as possible and get your sales force comfortable with having that conversation before the sale instead of after the close. Absolutely. That's, that's really great advice. Uh, here's one yeah, more. Lucky, that I, uh, lucky, lucky for us, too, I would just add one thing. Lucky for us, we have a great relationship with the sales team, and the sales team you know, allows us to incentivize our sales people as well for these and kind of run a, a bit of a contest around it. And that always adds some uh, excitement for the sales team to, to keep it top of mind. Another great way of incentivizing. Sure. So let the sales team know they can win by having testimonials. I love that too. That's great. Good. Um, here's another one that I think is uh, useful for all of us. And that is, um, so you, you have talked about brand ambassadorship all the way through all employees. And so, um, what what specific things can a company do if they're not actively doing that now? Where did you start, and how do you get that kind of rolling? You go, yeah, it's interesting. You know, right, yeah, not, not soon after I got here, we launched our uh, first ever really brand campaign. And as I explained, we we're kind of known as a printer company, so it's really important that people see us for not just the portfolio we have, but the solutions and the things that we can do. And hopefully through some of the videos, you get a better idea of, of, of some of those things, and they're well beyond – printing, and certainly beyond even just a mobile computer or a scanner. Um, so when we launched the program, we launched it very publicly on the town hall. We used our uh, internal uh, website to promote it. We also created a, uh, a kind of campy uh, brochure that we sent to all the employees. And we also made sure that, you know, we, I, what I always like to do is help people understand. It's important when some, everyone asks you, like, what do you do at a cocktail party? Uh, it's great to have a good answer. And if you say, well, we're the printer guys, you're not going to have a lot of friends at the cocktail party. So it's better to make sure you can tell the story really effectively. So we use some of the case studies internally. So, for example, we have a company who we can talk about uh, externally called Africa, and they're actually in the uh, medical cannabis industry, and it's a very highly regulated uh, industry. So they need to track from seed to store all the information about that. And we brought that customer in and we, we explain that story, and it's one that a lot of people can resonate with. The NFL is another one. We know that people resonate with what we do for the NFL. I was actually at the Monday night game last night uh, uh, promoting our solution there, but people resonate. So when you find some of those examples that can resonate, you can turn that into something that, that, that your employees can turn into an interesting short story they can tell, whether it's in an elevator or whether it's in a uh, at a cocktail party, where they can explain the company in the way that you want the company to be seen, it's very effective because every one of those interactions is potentially important. So uh, those are some of the things we did. We did the brochure. We launched it at the town hall. We reinforced it with these uh, with uh, videos and some of the testimonials. And we've even done some you know fun video, viral videos internally uh, where we have different people walk into an elevator and give their elevator pitch, as it were, and we keep those videos kind of fresh and out to the employees to keep them thinking about how do they build their own uh, elevator pitch and how do they how do they be prepared for it? Because the second somebody asks you that question, if you're not ready, you've missed the opportunity. And can you remind us again how many employees do you have? We have approximately 6,800. Okay, so yeah, you have a good size uh, workforce. I'm just imagining everybody going up and down the elevator with these great stories. I'd love to see those. Probably fun. <laughs> yeah, well, we could explain one of those videos. We we make those. Uh, uh, really fun. So uh, there, we always have interesting people in the elevator, and they always tell kind of interesting stories, and uh, we get a good reaction to it. And it keeps it fresh, and, and uh, people share it, and they think it's funny. Terrific. Um, we have another question that's come in. We, we're um, coming up on the end of the hour, but I'll continue to take questions as long as you'll send them to me. Um, what is the – so the, I'll read this one out. I'm not sure if I know exactly. I'll try to interpret it. What is the impact of digitization of the marketing and sales process on the sales force itself. How does that work for you? So I'm, I'm imagining that they're talking about things like having to collect a lot of data and having all of the marketing and sales tools be digital today. Does that, does that affect the sales function? I, you know, I, I think that um, it certainly affects the sales function because I think sometimes the, the, like the example I gave earlier is, you know, it used to be that the salesperson was the educator. And that process has is, is changed a little bit, and they're more the advisor. And I think uh, by digitizing things, it just changes the role of sales a bit. And I think they, they know that by the time they got in there, 
uh, and they've gotten into an opportunity, it's likely the customer already knows all the options that they might have, and they may already have a preconceived notion of what some of the advantages are. Um, but having digital tools is also helps them prepare. So one, for example, one of the things we've been trialing is an app where we can push notifications uh, and things like uh, we do um, uh, kind of silver bullets when we're selling particular products or solutions to make sure that it's top of mind of where are the key areas where we think that we have a, a dif some differentiation or an advantage. And they can get pushed those notifications or they can pull them up even when they're sitting in the parking lot waiting to go into a meeting. So we try to make sure we get that information to them when they need it. Uh, just being digital sometimes isn't good enough. Um, uh, a smart guy once told me, you know, hey, if you're in marketing and this gentleman was in sales, he goes, don't ever tell me the answer to my question is it's on the web somewhere. It's on the Internet somewhere on the sales side. Don't ever tell me that because I don't have time to go to it. So being digital is important. And moving to a more digital platform is good. But what we're seeing, we're getting a great reaction to is finding ways to have more push notification and more of an app is a better way to consume than having a, a sales enablement site, which most companies have, because quite honestly, salespeople don't go to it. And I've seen this in a number of companies. I think that's great advice. The two pieces I just took away from that was one, sales has gone from being the educator to the advisor. I think that is so true with people, you know, learning what they can learn. But more interestingly, they'll do that before they've talked to you, just as you point out. And then when they have a question, the last thing they want is to be pointed back to the website that they've already gone through because they didn't find it then. Just give them the answer, right? And that, that people, uh, that human interaction is really important at that point when they're asking questions. Great, great answer. Um, okay, I don't see any other new questions coming in. Um, we've uh, been through our first uh, hour of our presentation. Jeff, I want to thank you again so very much. This was really, really interesting, and I'm really excited for Zebra, and I'm thinking a lot about where I can use your products as well, so that's really exciting for me. Um, let me make a note to the audience. So uh, thank you all for those of you that have joined us. Those of you that have joined us as a group, um, all may be watching the same screen in a conference room. Uh, thank you for joining us that way. If you'd like to ask individual questions and type from your own laptop or tablet, please do just um, uh, dial in from your registration. And if you need to register, just let us know quickly. We'll get you a registration before the next presentation. Our next presentation is up at 1030. We have purposely left some time here for uh, discussions internally and just for breaks. And so as you did last time, if you came in a little earlier than the hour, you're going to hear a little music before um, we start live exactly at 1030. The system that we have is really timely, so it will start exactly on time at 1030. Feel free, though, to dial in and get in ready earlier. You just won't hear anything until that 1030 time frame. If you have questions about how to use the system, you can type those into the Q&A box at any time. I'll see those. If you have big concerns, um, feel free to do the help button, and um, I will reiterate the phone number at the beginning of the hour again if you really have some challenges where you can get some direct help by phone. Uh, again, thank you all for uh, visiting with us this morning and joining us for the first presentation of ISBM's Big Talk, and I will see you again in about 15 minutes. Thank you very much.